Good evening. This is weird. Um, yeah, uh, thinking about the different times I've been in this room and on this stage, although the strangest one, I was not on the stage, I was just in this room for the 25th anniversary of the Commodore 64 um, celebration, which was here. Who else was here? Not that's all? All right. Uh, so I was asked if I wanted to give a talk uh, for VCF West, and I thought no, because um, I don't really have anything all that interesting to talk about. But I suspected that there would be some non-trivial number of people that would have some questions that they wanted me to answer or at least questions that they hoped I had answers to. Um, so I thought I'll give a talk as an excuse to have a really extended Q&A. Um, but something, did in, something did interesting did happen in the last couple of years, um, which is what I'll talk about. So in search of the wooden pet, uh, back in 1976, Commodore Business Machines, led by Chuck Peddle, produced one of the first personal computers, the Commodore PET. I joined Chuck's team early in the development of the machine. My most obvious contribution was the design of the graphics character set that allowed the simple hardware to produce a wide range of images, some actually recognizable. The machine was developed from concept to demo device in the amazingly short time of about seven months, um, which was a hell of a lot of work. I assume everyone here um, knows all about this, uh, but what might not be known is that unlike many computers, for several months there was only one prototype, and that machine was different in several ways from later prototypes and production machines. The first public demonstration of the PET was supposed to be at the Consumer Electronics Show, CES, in Chicago in January of 1977 a prototype consisting of a power supply, card cage for the computer logic as well as keyboard, cassette drive, and monitor that were quite close to those used in the, development, in the production machines was built, but it didn't work. The machine was developed using a device called the MDT for Microprocessor Development Terminal, which plugged into the processor socket on the board. Everything worked when the MDT was plugged in, and it was designed so you just had to pull the MDT out plug the 6502 in and it would work, but it didn't. The last couple of weeks before the show were incredibly frustrating because everything worked, except that it didn't when you unplugged the MDT and plugged in the 6502. Um, so we were planning on showing the machine at the uh, Commodore booth. Uh, we're not gonna show the machine with this you know, monster honking cable plugged into the thing with this big, because that, that doesn't look right. Uh, so it was shown instead at the um, Commodore Suite in a nearby hotel, uh, which was uh, an interesting choice. Uh, Chicago in January uh, can be chilly. Uh, it was, I think, 30 below, possibly worse with the wind chill. Um, it was bad enough that the CES people warned you that if you're going to go from the hotel to the exhibit hall or from hotel to hotel, um, beware of frostbite. Um, but anyway, the, uh, it didn't work, but it worked well enough for the, um, uh, for the suite. So the, the case for this machine, and that's a picture of the machine in question with, uh, with Chuck Peddle, uh, the guy in charge of the design and everything about the machine is his, uh, with very few exceptions, including the microprocessor, uh, which was in just about everything, uh, including the Commodore PET, and derivatives of it in all other Commodore machines up to the, uh, what was that thing called? Friendly Amiga, right. Um, so the, the big difference between this machine and the pets that you'll see in the, um, in the exhibits is it's all smooth curves instead of these flat planes. Um, and unlike those metal K 
cases and the what you'd think of as you know plastic or resin or something cases that was made of wood is actually carved polished wood um, which is kind of weird uh, the machine was the only one around and it made the uh, uh, made the rounds to lots of places including the front cover of popular science magazine so this machine went everywhere um, the standout example of this machine of doing demos was at least in my mind the 1977 CBIT this is the consumer electronics component of the huge Hanover Mesa trade show. This show was so big it was said to double the population of the city of Hanover. And CBIT was actually a very small part of it. Uh, the, the pet had the seat next to me in the plane um, and I carried it, you know, everywhere. Uh, after a really fun um, episode trying to get through customs, uh, which you can ask me about in the extended Q&A to follow, uh, caused me to miss my connecting flight. So we went to rent a car uh, from, to drive from Frankfurt to Hanover, and because everyone in the world comes in through Frankfurt to go to Hanover, there were no cars available to rent. So we rented a Volkswagen minibus, um, and I sat in the back with the pet in my lap um, on the ground as we drove to Hanover. Uh, which was fun. Uh, after we arrived, we plugged the machine in, and it didn't work. And it didn't work for almost exactly the same reason that it didn't work in CES. Without getting into too much technical detail, which if asked, I will be very happy to do, the problem was uh, the reset circuit. The reset pin on the on the 6502 was not connected correctly. In the case of the machine that I had hand carried, the small push button switch at the back that did reset had been torn loose at some point in carrying either by me or by the customs people or in the van or something. And it was hanging on by a few strands of stranded wire. Um, at that time, it was harder than you would think to figure out how things were supposed to work. You couldn't just, you know, Google reset circuit uh, for a, a variety of reasons. Um, so after a, borrowing a soldering iron and a transatlantic phone call, which was actually a big deal at the time, I was told what to attach to what and the machine worked. Uh, and that was, that was a blast, uh, the number of people coming by uh, we were one row over from the Hewlett-Packard uh, exhibit, and they had very similar machines in terms of capability, uh, microcomputers running basic using the same IEEE 488 interface to talk to um, printers and the like, and their, the cheapest machine they had was $12,000, and it ran slower than our pet. Um, it was fun. Um, after leaving Germany, I went to London with Kit Spencer, where we demoed the machine again, and we appeared. There's, I guess it's not obvious which one's me. The guy on the left um, is me, uh, on the right-hand picture um, is me, and the other person who's more face-on is Kit, and there's the pet. And um, they misspelled it, they didn't all capitalized pet, but it's all right, it's the London Sunday Times, they're, they're allowed to do things like that. Um, by the summer of 1977, uh, more prototypes had been produced, and the original pet wasn't used that much. As far as I can tell, the last time it was displayed in public was at the World of Commodore Exposition in Toronto in 1983. It would have been towards the end of the year, if I remember correctly, end of 1983. Um, up until that time, it had been kept um, in his office by John Fagans, one of the other guys that, that worked on the PET, uh, absolutely instrumental in making all of the software work for most common machines up to that time. Uh, the machine left to the World of Commodore Exposition, did make it back to John's office. Uh, when John left in uh, early 1984 to uh, left Commodore to join Atari, 
or what became Atari, um, he lost track. He was pretty sure he knew who the next person to get it, thought it went to somebody um, in Westchester for you know, Commodore uh, back on the East Coast. And for, for years, we wondered, you know, what happened? Where, where is this thing? Um, so John double-checked and I double-checked and we contacted various Commodore engineers and they all went, oh, I think I know what you're talking about. Did you ask this guy? Yes. Does he know? No. Because um, if, if he had, I wouldn't be asking you. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I didn't, didn't say that out loud, at least I don't think so. Um, and it's, it's easier to edit when you're doing it by email. Um, so we, we kept, kept wondering about this. Um, in a private Facebook group of Commodore enthusiasts, I mentioned my search. And everyone agreed that it would be great to track this machine down. And it would be a huge shame if it had been lost or destroyed. In October 2019, one of the participants here, well, right there, um, Jim Happel, found a photo that showed an unusual looking pet on display at Stanford University in a small exhibit in what I think was the Gates um, computer display thing on early personal computers. And I saw that and went, because <gasps> um, yeah, that's, that's it, it's unmistakable. Uh, well, at least to me. And um, arrangements were made by another exhibitor sitting next to Jim, Chuck Hitchens, to get some people from the group, uh, including some people that were going to fly out from the East Coast to go to Stanford to see it. But there was a problem. We asked for a current photograph, and we got that. Which, um, as many of you will have noticed, is not a smooth, wooden hand carved prototype thingy, it's that, which is a fine machine, but as a priceless artifact and the only uh, machine of its type ever made, um, didn't work. So if you look in the upper right where it says on that thing up on the wall, Commodore Pet and below it, uh, I think that's the logo of the Boston Computer Museum. And the um, archives, uh, whatever the right word is in, in um, museum speak, of the Boston Computer Museum came here. So we thought, okay, maybe it's here. So you go online and you search their catalog. Um, if you do it now, you don't get the same results that I got a couple of years ago. Um, and there were several Commodore pets in the hardware artifact section. And it was noticed by some eagle-eyed people in the group that one of the items had four pictures. And one of these things is not like the other. So some of the pictures were of this one and some were of that one. So I contacted the museum uh, and informed them of this discrepancy and the importance of the machine. And I was told that they would investigate, and they did remarkably quickly. <sighs> that was just, just amazing. OK, so you found it. Are you sure? Yes. Can I see it? Well, um. Probably. All right, what's the, what's the problem? Well, as you might imagine, uh, so the, the goal of this institution besides the public displays is to have a very long term, and they're talking 500 year um, time scale. They're going to preserve things for at least that time scale to preserve the history of computers, not just personal computers, but computers. And if you look through the, even the exhibits that are on here now, you'll find machines all abacai. Is that the correct plural of abacus? Um, that date back 
thousands of years. I mean, they're, they're serious about doing this whole history thing. And they got more stuff than you could hold in several of these buildings. And there are secret um, places around places that uh, where they, they have things. And the, the pet was in one of those. So after a surprisingly difficult time getting everyone scheduled together in the match, it was arranged for John and I to meet at a secret off-site storage facility of the museum. I entered the conference room, and there on the table was the wooden pet. Get choked up thinking about it. Uh, my, I can't begin to describe the reaction. It was just, just amazing. Um, so, of course, the first thing we did was take it apart. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, uh, John and I had um, assembled and disassembled this machine so many times it was ridiculous, um, you know, including at trade shows. Uh, I don't know, and I, I have not been able to track down exactly when all this stuff happened. You'll notice um, just in the upper right from the machine there are some pink packing peanuts. Um, the inside of the machine was filled with these, um, which is not, not a good sign. Um, after putting on gloves, they allowed us to take it apart. We opened it, and we got some pictures. So there it is from, from the side. There is the, uh, the innards. Uh, lots, of, uh, lots of wire wrap boards and cables and really big capacitors. And, uh, yeah, that was, that was a fun machine to build and uh, the reset switch is, <laughs> is still there. Um, they wouldn't let us even think about turning it on, and I don't blame them. Uh, so I don't know if it works, uh, you know, the switch or the, or the machine itself. Uh, but it is, it is firmly attached, and all three wires are, are hooked up as they should be. So um, I tried to get the machine to be displayed here for this event, um, and they said no. Uh, and I'm simultaneously understanding and disappointed, because uh, it would be cool. Uh, but if you have a 500-year time scale and you want to make sure you are preserving something that is unique, um, you want to be really damn careful. Um, and they did not have the uh, resources in terms of lots of things, including personnel. Uh, to, to pull this off, but we got pictures. And um, thanks. So, so this part, um, the, the part that just, just ended, um, this, this is not at all fun for me because I knew everything I was going to say. Uh, but the Q&A is the fun part. So, anybody got so, someone? I haven't even asked for questions yet. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. So, the question was what is the end game? Is it going to be put away like Raiders of the Lost Ark, or will it be available for people to see? Um, and I think the answer is mostly put away like Raiders of the Lost Ark. But when appropriate, when there is some other exhibit for which this fits, they will cycle through. And they do that. Um, there are lots of artifacts that cycle through between here and the, the top secret places um, around. Yes? I I think they didn't know what it was. They knew it was a Commodore pet, um, but they didn't know that it was the only Commodore pet like it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so it, it was not, they, they, they didn't know. Yes. No, um, 
So we don't know how it wound up in the Boston Computer Museum or in the, uh, uh, in the collection of the Boston Computer Museum that somebody at Commodore, when Commodore was closing up, um, went, huh, this should go someplace, um, and sent it to the Boston Computer Museum, but I can't, I have not found anyone that will admit to doing that. Uh, but, so, it got there somehow, and I don't think it was because it walked on its own. Yeah? I noticed that This is the only one. So this is the only pet that has two very obvious physical mechanical differences. One is it has a smoothly curved wooden case as opposed to the straight edged metal ones. And every pet following this one also had a single PCB that had everything on it as opposed to that which was a card cage of individual parts. Yeah? Two questions. Um, the first one is, are, have the ROMs been archived separately? Um, could, because I assume there were some ROMs between this and the production pets. Oh, there's, uh, so the first question uh, was, uh, have the ROMs been archived because there's going to be differences? Um, there are more differences than you think. Um, because not only is the software different, the ROM space was smaller. Uh, so the uh, production code wouldn't even fit in these machines. Um, and the answer to your question is no. The ROMs have not been archived, but the museum has, uh, has been informed that there are people interested in doing this. And if anyone wants to put together a plan for how they're going to do this, what they're going to do to take the ROMs out and not wreck anything, what equipment they're going to use to read the ROMs, um, we can start the, the balls rolling and uh, do it. And your second question. I have no idea what problem it was. Uh, the only machine that could have been is this one. Um, so Chuck wrote a lot of the code that's in the machine, in particular the, the, the hairiest, nastiest stuff to do, which was the um, cassette routines. And he had a, um, we'll call it a characteristic. Um, he would just, you know, mess with it because, you know, he wants to make it better. Um, and, you know, I'm trying to remember who said this, uh, but code is hard to write, so it should be hard to read. Uh, so why bother documenting? Because that just makes it easier. <laughs> uh, so Chuck didn't always, um, Git did not exist. You, you know, couldn't archive you know, your working version to GitHub and get it back. Uh, so he would make a change and forget what the change was. Um, and it would stop working. Um, so yeah, I'm not at all surprised that there, something broke. But he fixed it. Yeah. Yes. So um, I've heard multiple stories, um, none of which are horribly reliable, but I'll tell you them anyway without telling you where I heard them from. Um, one was this was designed by Porsche, by Porsche Design, which um, sounds great and is probably not true. Um, the other is that the bottom of the machine uh, was designed to look and feel like an IBM Selectric. And if you look like it, if you look at it, it looks like it. And then the top was just designed to match. 
Um, but who did it? I don't know. But we never used it in production. Um, although many years later, uh, the B series Commodore machines are sort of kind of reminiscent, but they're not made of wood, so you know, they're plastic. If you don't have a you know a good solid wooden computer, you know why why bother? <laughs> yeah, and if you have any questions about things other than the this particular pet and looking for it, um, you're here, I'm here. Let's let's go. Yeah. <laughs> I do not believe they tried. Yeah, um, it's pretty well sealed, as in painted, so I don't think that's going to issue, and as long as it's um, not wet, uh, it should last a good long time. Yeah? Right, we, yeah, so we, we saw this picture, and that's it on the upper right. So it would have gone from the computer history museum, from the Boston Computer Museum to the Computer History Museum, and then that was loaned temporarily to Stanford. Yeah. Gee, I expected more more questions. Yes, sir. I, I didn't try physically restraining them, um, so there, there probably was was a way, uh, but it was not a way that I was interested in in exploring. Um, so no, no, not yeah. No. Uh, no, the, the Petsky characters, uh, once we said, okay, this is it, um, did not change. Um, in hindsight, there were a couple of things I wish we had changed, uh, but um, it works pretty well. So, yeah, the, uh, once they were put in ROM, they're, they're, well, in this case, EEPROM, um, they were the same. Yeah. So the, the question is, why use the checklet keys in the first machine? And um, part of it was because we wanted to have a single self-contained unit. Um, and there simply was not room, or the machine would be really huge if it had a full-size keyboard and a cassette. Um, and then once we have the constraint that it's going to be this size with the, um, with the cassette tape, then you've got a small keyboard. And given the choice of finding a keyboard manufacturer that's going to make a custom typewriter-like keys with, you know, with the, the offsets and everything that was scaled down to fit, um, that probably wouldn't have been any better to type on. Um, and would have cost um, a lot. Uh, and uh, my dad was not in favor of, of doing that because uh, spending a lot of money was, was not one of his favorite habits. Um, so, yeah, uh, the calculator keyboard manufacturers went, yeah, we can do that, no problem. So they did, and we bought them. Yeah. Two questions in my mind. Um, what's the weight differential? What is the case versus the little giant steel ones? And second one, if we just talk about here. Well, let's do one at a time. Um, so I, I do not remember, you know, actual weights. We could 
find out, but it's actually a pretty hefty chunk of wood. Um, can't see it all that well there. Yeah. Uh, so there are more pictures. Let me see if I can quickly bring up. If I can show up over there. Yes. Let's move it over here where I can play in private. No, I'm not going to type my, uh, my password or anything. this yesterday and I'm doing it wrong. So uh, that's one of the curators, and that's a, uh, see a, a framed um, drawing that John rescued from the dumpster uh, of the machine. That's a, an original listing of BASIC in 6502 Assembler with John's handwritten notes on it, which uh, one of these days uh, I might get uh, a machine readable version back. I donated. You can see that it's been, the CRT got pushed in a bit. It is still under that access number if you look at the, uh, um, the archives now. Yeah. So you can see that the side of it is pretty thick. So it's a, it's a hefty chunk of, of wood. Um, so this is funny. Uh, I don't know which Wise, Wiseacre did this, but that is a, a typical 1990s chain letter um, that was folded up and stuck inside the monitor section. Uh, whoever, whoever did it did not have good luck. Um, did you put that back yet? No. Yeah, so uh, taking out some of the uh, pecking peanuts and gives you a better look at, at how hefty that hunk of wood is. So the weight difference isn't all that much. Um, either of them is, uh, is a noticeable task to carry around um, in the airport. Yeah. I have no idea. I, I was not involved in, in actual manufacturing. It's it's. Uh, I look closely at those photos. You can see some drawings. Yeah, no, there, it's it's not a single piece of wood. It was uh, was not you know some huge log that they carved out. <laughs> that that would be excessive. Spontaneous computer combustion. Yeah, um, and the the facility that the Computer History Museum has this in is temperature controlled and humidity controlled and all that stuff. Uh, so they're they're good at, at uh, 
worrying about that. Yeah. What happened? German customs. Uh, German customs. Uh, so I walk up carrying this machine and I say, um, this is for display at the Hanover Messe. And he uh, sort of understood that and said, you must pay customs. Okay, you must, you must pay duty. I said, okay. Um, I'm going to be taking it back in a week as we bring it back home. Then you must not pay duty. Um, and then he asked another question, and I must pay duty, and then I must not pay duty. Um, and and this, this was um, not resolved uh, between his broken English and my non-existent German. Uh, eventually someone from Commodore Germany uh, who had been told that this was going to happen, uh, showed up. Uh, he, he made it, th I mean, he, he was there long before he was needed to be, but trying to get through the, uh, uh, the authorities was, uh, was a problem. Uh, but eventually it was all settled. And I, and I had paperwork that explained exactly what it was, where it was going, how long it was gonna be there, what the fact that no duty was required, um, but uh, yeah, it just, it just, it, it took for bloody ever. Yes? Can you tell us more about what chips are in this? In terms of, like, are there legit versions of 6545 or street logic for some parts of the intermediate chips? Or is it all small? So this is, this is a Commodore PET, which has no custom chips in it at all. Um, I don't think there were any versions of the PET that had any custom silicon. Um, so there's 6502s and 6520s and 6522s, um, and that's it. And if, if you push hard, I'll admit that some of them had 6550 RAMs, but we don't talk about those. <laughs> um, yeah, but nothing, nothing custom. Yeah. So the, the port in the back um, was the, the user port, which with an appropriate uh, adapter and the appropriate software was um, IEEE 488. Um, but mostly it was a user port used to do all sorts of fun stuff. Uh, hook your pet up to do various things. Um, so when I left Commodore, I went to New York City, to Columbia University, to start my uh, graduate program in physics. And I had a pet in my, uh, in my apartment. And when I started work in the astrophysics lab, uh, the first project that I was assigned to um, was uh, plumbing. Uh, there was an x-ray source that needed water cooling. Uh, so uh, one of the other graduate students and I were building a, a plumbing system to cool this thing, which is, you know, what you need PhDs in physics to do. Well, I guess we just, we only had masters at that point. Um, and I found out that they were, they were working on a project that was supposed to fly on the third flight of the space shuttle using a Intel 8085 microprocessor system um, to measure stuff um, and they had a very expensive contractor from Laurel Space Industries doing all this thing and I went hmm I can probably do that so I brought the pet in and made sure that everybody knew that I knew a lot about electronics and computers and programming and stuff um, so uh, one one time I was doing an experiment uh, collecting data and the lab equipment that we had was, had limitations on the number of counts it could hold until it needed to be reset, such that the background would saturate the equipment in about two and a half hours. And I needed to take a week's worth of data. So every two hours for a week, I needed to write down a number and push a button which is not good. 
Uh, so I designed a little bit of hardware, hooked it up to the back of the pet, um, and it did it for me. Um, and everybody thought, ooh, that's cool. Um, so I, I assume it got used for that sort of thing a lot um, by people other than me, but uh, at, least, at least I did. Anything else? It's got to be something. Yes? Yeah, yeah, the whole thing is wood, including the, uh, the housing around the monitor. Yes? So Commodore was um, about the flattest uh, management structure of any company anywhere ever, and hopefully there will never be another one like it again. Um, but between the lowest employee and the president, um, there were usually two people. Um, so. Between that and the fact that I was the SOB, the son of, son of the boss, um, yeah, there was no. <laughs> I, at, at some level, I was, I was a, you know, a grunt. Um, uh, my first job at Commodore was um, forklift driver. Um, so, but on, on the other hand, if I needed something, hey, Dad. So, yeah. Yeah. The public and the press, if you will. So I had a long history of doing that. Um, in the mid 1960s, I'm trying to remember, maybe it was 68, something like that. I went with my dad, so I was 14. I went with my dad to Chicago to a sort of predecessor of CS, uh, NAMDA the National Office Machine Dealers Association show to and where they were demonstrating their first programmable calculators. Um, and none of the salespeople knew how to program anything. Um, and calculators were, you know, magic. Uh, so the, they had this 14-year-old kid writing programs and showing people how it worked. So I had been demoing Commodore computer stuff um, for many years uh, before that. So, yeah. Yes? When you think back over your career, what are a couple things that really, really enjoy, really make you happy about the contribution So, when you say career, <laughs> um, do you mean Commodore, Atari, or physics, or? Whatever you want to talk about. All of it. All of it. Of, of everything I've done in my life, what am I most happy about? Well, the, 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 of course, the, the required answer is, is my wife and kids. Um, that's, you, you have to say that, especially since Robert's recording this is gonna put it on YouTube, so um, my wife will hear this. Uh, but um, in addition to those uh, wonderful things, um, So I've done a lot of stuff in the last few years um, with regard to science and science education. Uh, I spent, so someone mentioned, uh, we were joking earlier, uh, and you know, the, the statement was made that anything I put my mind to, I will succeed in. Uh, no. Uh, I spent a decade bashing my head against the California Department of Education trying to convince them of the completely ridiculous idea that textbooks should be factually accurate. Because, you know, what a, what a stupid thought. Um, and, I, and I completely failed at that. But I think I did at least start some balls rolling um, uh, before these things came around. Uh, I would volunteer once a week up at the Chabot Space and Science Center and um, explain space science and astronomy and stuff to uh, 
hundreds of uh, school kids for their uh, the field trips. That's that's great stuff. Um, and being involved in Commodore and the and Commodore's role in the computer business, which I, I think is, is kind of a weird one. Um, if Commodore didn't exist, there would still be personal computers. There's no question about that. You know, Apple computers were there, TRS 80s, IBM would have come out. Um, I think the real thing that Commodore did to the market was because of my father's relentless drive to get the price down um, many more people bought computers and became familiar with them. So when the industry was ready for an influx of engineers, they were available. Uh, so I, I, I think that, that, that's a cool thing. That was, that was, that was good. Yeah. Yeah. So at the trade show where we first demonstrated the pen, what software did we show? Basic. And then whatever I typed in. Um, yeah, so um, uh, so I have a, a, a blog that I've written with a, a few other Commodore uh, and Atari people. Um, and there's an entry which I've been meaning to write uh, which is about software, and um, well, you you tell me. Um, first or second year of graduate school for the summer, before I started working in the lab, I came home for the summer, um, mostly because the thing that I was living in, which Columbia University called an apartment, but the city called a condemned building. Um, you weren't allowed to have human habitation in 12 months a year, so I had to leave for the summer. I'm not joking. Um, yeah, it was it was a it was a mess. Um, so I'm I'm home for the summer and I'm working at Commodore, and I was handed this box of software and said, please go through and evaluate these programs and see whether or not we should um, market them which at the time we called sell, because there was no such thing as marketing before Apple invented it. And um, there was this program that, yeah, worked pretty well, did some interesting stuff, but it wasn't anything that you couldn't write a basic program to you know, add up these numbers. It's you know, no big deal, what, what, why bother? This is, what a waste. Um, so I, Gave it that evaluation, not, not interested. Um, it was VisiCalc. Um, and about, so in 19, no, in 2010, I met one of the um, original authors of, uh, of VisiCalc um, at a conference. And he walks up to me and, and says, thank you. And I said, do I know you? And he said, no, but thank you. <laughs> I said, OK, for what? And he told me what had happened. And it turns out that both myself and my equivalent at Apple had exactly the same reaction. <laughs> and this forced VisiCalc, or these guys, to um, open um, software arts and become software distributors, um, which they did quite well in. So uh, yeah, so that, that was, you, you asked about things I'm proudest of. Um, that is the stupidest thing <laughs> I have ever done. Yeah, that was just, no, that, that, was, that was wrong. Uh, that was a bad choice. But it, it, it turned out OK. Yeah. What time is it? Yeah.
HP, which probably had a really polished setup, even back in those days, mm -hmm. and all of that, where you came with a machine made out of wood, just turned on by the grace of God. <laughs> well, and a, and a soldering iron. Yeah. What did the, do you remember anything about what a pitch looks like and what kind of... Well, what it was actually easier. So, uh, so the, the question is what about, you know, what, what was the pitch um, for the, the pet? And the fact is, the fact that we were right near the HP booth made it a lot easier because we can do anything they can do better. <laughs> um, so better, cheaper, faster, all of those things. Um, and as, especially since we had the same programming language and the same hardware interface. Uh, so, yeah. I do, I do not remember what, what model HP it was. Were you challenged at all by, 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 the, uh, by, the, uh, by the press? Like by, the, by those that you were pitching? Oh, yeah. I mean, which is why we just you know, wrote some code and ran it. Uh, you know, hook stuff up, and it worked. Uh, so, this, so not a not a Commodore um, anecdote, but an Atari one. Uh, very similar situation uh, when the Atari ST was first demonstrated in the January 1985 CES. Thankfully, in Las Vegas, not in Chicago. Um, similarly, the machine had gone from thought to working prototype in less than a year, and that year was worse. Um, that, was, that was amazing. Uh, someone from one of the computer magazines came over and said that they had been told that these machines were empty, and there was just a video cable going to a VAX in the back room. Um, and I said, okay, um, let's test this out. So in the middle of the, of the booth, in the middle of the floor, there were some electrical outlets. And I said, let's, let's get a lamp. And we unscrew it, and we plug it in and show that this is a live 120-volt circuit. And we took the computer and the monitor and plugged it in, and they worked. I said, any other questions? <laughs> So yeah, we were, we were challenged a lot. Um, but it's pretty easy to demonstrate that, you know, it did what it did. Yeah? Atari ST, it was TOS, the operating system. The operating system or training operating system? We did not for a moment think of it as anything other than the operating system. The idea of calling it Tremel operating system is something that my father would have absolutely rejected with, with great force. Uh, no, it was the operating system. So ST um, is 1632. Some people say it stands for Sam Tremel, my older brother who was president of the company. Um, no, it's 1632. And Yes. You can find it out. Yes, the cassette interface was working. This was in between chuck breaking it and fixing it again <laughs> multiple times. Yeah. Yeah, and we we demonstrated that. No. Well. I wrote a lot of programs on the fly because people would ask me, can you write a program to do this? Or how about that? And I would say, yeah. Yeah, the the open days of the books on the Atari, did you share? What was that like when you came to an existing business? It was it was hell. Um, so we came into Atari in, um, I guess it was July 5th, um, 1984. Uh, Atari was in the process of losing $2 million a day, $2 million a working day. 
They were losing money at a rate that was threatening to bankrupt Warner. Um, so they were eager to get rid of the damn thing. And if they could get something out of it, that would be nice too. But mostly they just want to dump it. Um, so we came in, um, took it from a 1,200 employee company in the Bay Area to 200 in two weeks. Firing 1,000 people is not good. Uh, it's, it's, it's something I do not recommend. Uh, it, it makes you sleep poorly. Um, John Fagans and I walked into a building, uh, and I think it was in Milpitas, where a bunch of the video game programmers that were working on games for the computers, so they were potentially our employees, were working. And we walk into the building, and one of the features of the building was a intercom system, where if you pick up any phone type of particular code, you could PA to the entire building. So we walk in, and we hear the announcement, the Imperial Stormtroopers have arrived. <laughs> Which I did not actually think was very funny um, at the time. Um, the guy that said that was one of the people we kept. Although we, we didn't know it at the time, and it would not, and I do not regret that decision. Um, he found out afterwards that um, my parents were both Holocaust survivors, uh, so he thought this was particularly inappropriate. Uh, but yeah, that, that pretty much encapsulates what it was like. Um, fire a thousand people in, in a week or two. Uh, it's, it, was, it was awful. Um, and then on top of that, you're supposed to go from uh, vague ideas to working custom chips with a graphical user interface that did not exist on anything yet um, and show it in, at January CS. Uh, so yeah, that was, that was a little bit of work. It was, it was hard. Yeah. Yeah, so um, there were very few places that you could get an operating system or a graphical user interface. Um, basically, it was a choice between Microsoft Windows um, and um, DRI's gem. Uh, so we went to both. Uh, we went to Microsoft first because they were the more likely to be able to deliver something because they actually had a product um, that was sort of shipping at the time. Um, and even more sort of working. And we described what the machine would be and how it would work and when it was due. And they said, we're sorry, we cannot do that. It's simply impossible. Um, and I, I remember going, um, you have a product, it's shipping, it works, what's the big deal? I said, well, if you were going to do this on a Intel platform, then we could do this. But if you're going to do it on the Motorola platform, you, we can't. And I said, um, what language is it written in? You know, is it in assembler? And he laughed and said, no, of course not. It's written in C. I said, OK. So you use a different compiler. And that's what high-level languages are for. And he looked sheepish for a moment and said, at Microsoft, each compiler compiles, well, each compiler is written for each product. They're different. They generate a byte code that goes to a custom interpreter that is different for each product on each processor. So it's written in C, but it's just as hard to port as if it were written in assembler, except that it's easier to port C than assembler. So um, ah. I believe that they got rid of that when they went to NT. The, so NT stands for new technology. Um, and I believe that is the new technology. Um, actually, you see to go to, to assemble 
because assemblers are supposed to do that. Um, yeah. So we went to, to uh, Microsoft um, and we went to DRI and they said, this is going to be hard. Um, but yeah, we can do it. It's going to take this, that, this, and that, and we're going to have to have a team set up and we're going to do this. And, and we said, okay. And we did it and it was hard. And uh, a dozen or so um, Atari and ex Commodore engineers moved down to um, Monterey and worked with the uh, digital research engineers. And I drove down once or twice a week and uh, tried to make things work better, and occasionally succeeded. Um, and it worked. A uh, remarkable group of people. I mean, both the Commodore and Atari people, you know, working for us, and the digital research people. Uh, just, just fantastic engineers. Um, the most interesting is we did not have hardware um, upon which to develop this. Uh, so what we used as a um, piece of hardware prototype uh, was a 68,000 base machine with um, bitmap graphic display. It was an Apple Lisa. So the uh, original um, port was to uh, Lisa hardware. That may have been the most productive thing Elisa has ever done. I did, did I say that out loud? I'm sorry. That's clearly not true. Not, not sure why, but it's clearly not true. Yeah? Gary Kildall was one of the smartest, kindest, uh, most wonderful people I've ever met. Uh, I have a picture in my bedroom of me shaking Gary's hand. Uh, great guy. Um, absolute visionary. Uh, more than most people give any appreciation of, he made personal computers happen. Um, Without the I first example of that was done by Gary um, and a couple of other people like Tom Rolander um, on a video disc, uh, literally with you know pictures of each thing, um, and they had that working. And I remember Tom, uh, Tom and Gary came up to uh, to show this to my dad and saying we need to do this. So he said, "Great." Go for it. Uh, so simultaneously on the ST and the PC, uh, the Grow Your American Academic Encyclopedia from DRI with this full reverse index was available. Um, yeah, I miss Gary. Yeah. Yes. Well, it was certainly not in my field of view. I was in charge of the operating system for the, uh, the ST line. Um, I knew the 8 bits were there. We had inventory. Um, so we sold them, and when people wanted to buy more, we made them. Uh, but the goal was not to continue with that. Uh, um, only as some form of consultation uh, to make sure, so that they understood how the, uh, the interface bus worked and what software would do what to where. Uh, so, but yeah, I, I worked with them a little bit, but, but not, uh, not from a development point of view, but from a uh, uh, debugging you know, and, and uh, optimization point of view. Yeah, smart guys. Yeah. And most of the people here are collectors, orders, otherwise? No. There are collectors here? So, confessions on your side, you've got still. Yes, that's What do I have in my basement? My basement is used. Be elaborate. 
So um, I have no vintage computers or calculators in use. I have nothing in use. Um, I have two pets. Um, one with a chiclet keyboard and one with uh, the, the larger keyboard. Um, neither of them work, although one of them did work as recently as three years ago. Uh, the one with the, uh, the larger keyboard. Uh, I have an Atari TT, uh, which I have not turned on in a long time. I have a Commodore SX-60. Um, SX-61, the, uh, the SX-64, thank you, which I wrote my PhD thesis on. Um, I have uh, a calculator, uh, I forget the model number, but it's the one that I wrote the, the, the firmware for. Um, the batteries were leaking, so I took it out. Um, so it doesn't work, but I'm pretty sure that if you attach power to it, it would. Uh, I've got couple of really old um, calculators, like a, I think it was a US-8. Um, I have a uh, couple of really vintage uh, typewriters that my father had collected, because uh, I don't know if you guys know this, but my dad started his journey into this repairing typewriters for the US Army when he was in the army. Um, so he had a, a love of the mechanics of typewriters. Uh, and then, you know, non-vintage computing stuff. I have more picks and um, Raspberry Pis and Arduinos and other, I, you know, I could drown in those. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, I'm, I'm a nerd. I'm not, I'm not a collector so to speak, uh, but my wife would disagree. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I believe we are actually over time, so let's, uh, one more question. When the witch was ready? Falcon, yes. Um, so the, the Falcon didn't take off, I think, because we didn't do enough to, and we didn't have the resources, um, to seed enough to developers to, to get it going. I, I think a Falcon, or the machine like a Falcon, would do great now. Um, there are things about the way that series of computers worked that I, I wish they would put into Windows. Um, so one of the functions, I don't, I don't know how many people even know this exists. If you open a window in TOS and click on the title bar, a dialog box will come up and allow you to enter a wildcard designation and it'll only show those um, files in that directory. So if you want to copy all of the PNG files that end in 2 from this directory to that directly on a Windows machine or on a Mac, the only way you can do that is to drop down to the, um, uh, the, the, pr the prompt or select them. Um, you could do the same thing without having to do anything outside of the user interface on an ST. <laughs> Please, if anyone is listening, put this feature into something. Because it's, it's good. Um, and the ability to um, switch audio tracks through, um, around, bypass, add, um, uh, add tweaks via the DSP that you could do in the, in the Falcon. I love playing with that machine. That was, that was just great. Um, so yeah, I think the reason that the Falcon didn't take off is we didn't 
push it hard enough. We didn't give it enough room to flap its wings to stretch the analogy far too far. All right, so thank you guys.